enterprises and it's really teaching them how to promote their business by using PR tools so all of the tools in it are PR tools um, I thought I might begin by trying to get us to agree on what PR actually is an awful lot of people think PR is free advertising you're in Google you know advertising isn't free right <laughs> <laughs> advertising you buy the space you put something in it and the purpose of advertising is to sell a product so it, it works or it doesn't work on the basis of how much product did you shift it's very easy to analyze Public relations, on the other hand, creates stories. It tells you who people are and what they do and why they're passionate about their business and why you should actually invest in them. I often think public relations people are like, they're like doctors, because um, they work from a goodie bag, but the goodie bag has loads of tools in them. So if you go to a doctor and you have a cough, the doctor may say to you, ma, it's a bit of a cough, it's no big deal, you need a cough bottle. The doctor may equally look at you and say, oh, I don't understand that cough at all. Okay, I need you to get x-rays, Last time I heard somebody with a cough like that, I never saw them a second time. Or the doctor may well look at you and say, you're a malingerer, there's nothing wrong with you, go back to work, I'm not giving you a certificate. But he, he dips into a goodie bag of tools and says, here's what you need. PR people do exactly the same thing. So we look at a business and we say, okay, if you're trying to communicate with people, which tool do you need to use? So should you be using exhibitions? Should you be using e-zines? Should you be using social media? Should you be using um, sponsorship? What's the tool that will work best for each different audience, because you won't reach everybody with the same tool. So this book is about 10 of the tools that I believe are most relevant to people in SMEs. Before I move on to them, I should actually mention the word spin, because every time you hear the word public relations, you hear spin, and PR people have this huge thing about we do not spin. We are not spin doctors, we are in public relations. I was introduced about two, three or four years ago as the princess of the dark art of spin. I absolutely <laughs> adored it. I have dined out on it ever since because I think that is exactly what we do. Businesses do it, people do it. I wore a suit this morning, I'm serious about being an author. That's my spin. I could have come in in a pair of jeans, you would have had an entirely different visual spin. You chose to dress exactly the way you chose this morning because it says something about you, the mood you're in, what you want to project to people in the world today. That's spin, that's a visual spin. We also do it by text. So there are two ways you can spin. One is visually, so what you look at says something about, it creates an expectation. But equally, text does the same thing. Let me give you an example. If I said that my best friend is a drug addict, what immediately comes into your head? What does drug addict say? Pills. Pills, takes drugs. Bit down and out, not really the best, uh, probably in a bad place right now, uh, needs to feed a habit so God only knows how they actually get enough money to feed the habit. The whole drug addict, just the use of the words drug addict says, hmm, I wouldn't have thought she had she associated with those kinds of people. If on the other hand I said my best friend is a recreational user, you go, whoa, too many parties. <laughs> 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 Gotta cut back on that stuff, it'll kill you eventually. It's a whole different spin. You're still talking about somebody who uses drugs, but it's a spin, it's a textual spin. Your head creates a different picture. And that's what PR people do. They say, don't look over there, look over here. That's what spin is about. It's not about telling a lie, it's about diverting your attention just a little bit. So, visual spin, let me look at four of the 10 red hot tips possibly that are included in this book. Visual, photo calls. Um, we live in a visual era. Look at the way we watch news and the way news is presented to us, how it's changed in the last 10 or 15 years. If you looked at news years ago, it was one person sitting to a camera on television saying, here is the news, and you had a clip behind. If you watch news on television now, you've got all of these boxes coming down the side with short little breaking pieces of news. You've got ticker tape running underneath. Nobody actually sits there and waits for the next story. We have no patience. But the visual tells us something. It's like I've seen um, this morning there was an avalanche. 
in Italy, I've seen the avalanche, I know what happened. It's a visual kind of thing. If you can create a really good visual, people will remember it. They associate it with your business. Um, there are two ways to do it. One is by photo call and one is by photo shoot. Photo call is where you actually invite all of the media to attend and you set up the picture for them. Photo shoot is where you create the photograph and you send it to the media. So let me give you an example of both. We did a photo, I must warn you in the fans, small little people, vertically challenged, generally called children. I don't have any of them. I find it very <laughs> difficult to communicate with them, okay? <laughs> you, we need to contextualize this story, okay? So I regard them as vertically challenged until they're my height and make eye contact and speak in fully formed sentences. They're like, nice to meet you, kid, move on. Okay? <laughs> so I'm doing this photo call and it's for the opening of a school. It's a gay school and I have two children, a photographer sitting beside me and he says, okay, what I want to get is that traditional shot. I want to get a little boy, little girl holding hands, walking at school day one. I thought, easy. I told you, I have no kids, okay? So I said, right, we need two, there's a little boy there, that little girl there, so yeah, they look actually nice. Sean, do me a favor, hold Maureen's hand, please. No. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Right. Maureen, hold Sean's hand, please. And she puts her hand out, and he goes, I'm not doing it. <laughs> okay, we go through this about two or three times, and I said to the photographer, like, this kid has an attitude problem. <laughs> He's not hold her hand. And he said, no, uh, and we're not going to get the shot. I said, no, no, we get the shot. I just need to lose the child. Okay? So without even thinking, I turned around. Now I'm in the zone. So I turned around and said, who owns the little boy? And the photographer turns back to me and went, who owns? Who owns? <laughs> I'm dead. I'm going to record this on film. Somebody is going to kill you. You do not own a child. And this father came pondering out of the group, right? Like a lunatic. And he goes, I'm Sean's father. And I still haven't really registered what the photographer said. So I said, uh, great, do me a favor, will you? The photographer's trying to get a shot for the Irish Times. The kid won't cooperate. I just wanted to hold her hand. He won't do it. Sorry about that. Kid had his chance. He's gone. I need to put another little boy in a place. <laughs> I don't do tactful either. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> what was the father's reaction? Any idea? Defensive? Uh, he made it good. Yeah. Told the child to hold hands. He had the child sideways. John, you <laughs> over. I want my God now. Because all the thought I heard was Irish Times. And he didn't hear the child being uncooperative. He didn't hear who owns the child. He heard Irish Times and my child. And we got the front page of the Irish Times the next day. Hmm. With the child, the little girl was like, eh. and the little boy, Rah. <laughs> but it was a classic shot. If you pinched the child, you couldn't have set it up better. From the <laughs> You're learning a lot about the way I work. Probably more than you needed to know. From the school's point of view, what they wanted was, they were looking for a bit of publicity that said the school has opened, it's a new school, it's in this area. And what they ended up was front page of the Irish Times with the shot that said, this is the new school that opened. And it was outside of Dublin. Um, so the chances of actually getting that kind of publicity were unreal. But it was a great photograph. So if you take a great shot, people will look at it and they remember it. The example that I used in the book was from Butler's Pantry. You all familiar with Butler's Pantry? Butler's Pantry is... Um, probably the best to describe it's kind of like a gourmet food outlet. You call in there if you want to buy really good quality, fresh homemade food on your way home in the evening. They're kind of like the way Marks and Spencer's do those food ads. You know the way you could have completely eaten an entire meal and you're stuffed and thinking, I never want to see food again, and a Marks and Spencer's food ad comes on and you go, oh, that looks lovely. And suddenly so you're hungry again. Food, if you're going to promote food, you have to promote food with that yumminess. And Butler's Pantry bring in a professional photographer each time they take photographs. But because photography is so expensive, and it's probably only about half the price that it was five or six years ago. Five or six years ago, if you brought in, before the, the crash, if you brought in a photographer to do any photo shoot, you said to the client, you need 1,200 to 1,500. You won't get out, you won't get change out of that. Now you're looking at somewhere around three to 600, so it's a big change. But for a small business, you're still looking at and bringing in a photographer to take a photograph and I don't know if anybody will use it. So I'll have a really good quality photograph, but will it be used? And what Butler's Pantry do is they trial all the photographs. So if they're doing a new, I don't know, salmon dish, they, they storyboard the entire thing. So this is how we would like to promote salmon. This is what we want people to think and feel. When we say salmon, we want to go, oh, salmon, I haven't had salmon in a long time. Fresh fish, gorgeous salmon of knowledge, whatever it is. And then they try to create the photograph. So they spend days seeing what works best. Should I put this here? Should I put that there? 
um, how exactly do we mix the people, the, the groups together, and when they think they have it exactly right, then they get the photographer in, and the photographer literally shoots it. But the photographs that they take have been used for up to five years, which is a very long time to get out of a photo, but it's good value. But their attitude is if they spend that much money, they really want to be sure before the photographer comes in the door that it's giving the message that they want it to. And that's a visual message, and that's public relations, that's a photo call. The second area I wanted to look at was sponsorship, because people seem to think that sponsorship is all about having lots of money. Everybody knows the big sponsorships because they're in your face, they've got huge budgets behind them. Sponsorship can work really, really well for a small to medium sized enterprise, but it only works really well if, like everything else you do in life, you put time into it and you think it through. So let me give you two examples of sponsorship, one good and one bad. The example I used in the book was a company called Action Coach. Action Coach work with small to medium sized enterprises. And their job is that they Basically, they go into companies and they teach them how to be more competitive. So that may be um, how to take risks in certain markets. So they may say to them, look, you're, you're, targeting, you're targeting a market that's far too broad. You're never going to reach everybody. You need to try a little bit tighter. Or it may be that you just don't know what you're doing in terms of money. So we need to actually teach you a little bit more about profit and loss and how to manage money and how to look after cash flow. And basically, they work with small businesses trying to get them to the next step. They're based in Ballymun. And they're very passionate about being in Ballymun and what can they do for people in Ballymun. And there's, I'm going to be shocked now, there's a, a rugby player, I, I'm hopeless on sports, who's from Ballymun. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Anyway, oh, he could be a gal player. Anyway, there's a guy who's a very well known sports person from Ballymun. And they met him at a talk one day. Literally, they were just sitting listening to him talking, and he was talking about the fact that he'd come from Ballymun, his family were very poor, he'd done very well, he was looking to give something back to the area. And it started them thinking, and they developed a board game. And the board game teaches you how to deal with profit and loss, how to look after cash flow, how to take risks, how to analyze risks. And they decided what they would do is they would work with local schools. And they would go into local schools and create a competition, but teach children how to, how to build up these skills. And the objective was twofold. One was that they might actually find that they have an interest in commerce, or becoming entrepreneurs, or running their own businesses. But the second was that if they never did, they have developed skills which were useful for the rest of their lives. And that's a really good example of sponsorship. Another example, sort of by comparison, you're in what we all call Google Lounge now, but I used to live around the corner on Ringsend Road. Um, so I don't know whether you should be welcoming me to Google Lounge or I should be thanking you for inviting me back home again. <laughs> but I lived on Ringsend Road and I was very involved in the community in Ringsend because I was there, I lived there all my life. I got married, moved away, came back to live there. Um, when I was married, I only moved out about 15 years ago. And I just, I love being involved in community, because um, I think it's who we are. We don't have enough community involvement, whether it's community of interest or physical community in which we live. We had a Glamorous Granny competition quite a few years ago. And the Glamorous Granny competition was sponsored by the local beauticians, which I thought was a really nice fix. It was, it was clever. The Glamorous Grannies all came in, and they ranged in age at that time, I'm going back probably 20 years, from like 55 to 75. Now they would range in age from 35 to 75. Um, but they, they range in age from about 55 to 75. So most of the ladies came in and they had that lovely uh, gray buffed hair that looked like they'd just taken the curlers out. You know, you know that look that people have? And they came up and they sang, they talked about like their, their three children and their two grandchildren and how old they were and what their names were. Very nice, very pleasant evening. All of the husbands, by the way, who were alive, came in and stood, only came in for a bit, and came in and stood at the end of the hall, watched her, and went, that's grand, and went back off it for a pint again. And wouldn't stay for the rest of the night. But they, they did their bit, they did it really well, and the beauticians was giving a prize for whatever it was, 200 euros worth of goods in the beauticians. They sent in a young model to present the prize. So you've got a room full of people who are 55, 75 years of age, all female, and they sent in this absolutely drop-dead, gorgeous-looking girl. She was tall, she was sticky and set pin, she was on heels this high, like she was teetering on Jimmy Choo's. She walked in the way models do, they kind of walk like cats on high heels. She, <laughs> she strutted her stuff all the way up to the stage. She looked amazing. She came up and she presented all of the prizes, and what everybody did in the audience, as she walked past, would say, oh my God, look at the height of those heels. 
Can you remember ever where he is that high? Oh yeah, but it was before I had my first child. Never one high. He is that high since. <laughs> Look at her little waist. She's a size eight. I'd say she's a size ten. <gasps> I was never a size ten. The smallest I ever was was a twelve. And actually, what they did was they reminded people of what it was like to be young or single or before they had children. They brought them back to their twenties. They did not target them as fifty-five to seventy-five year olds. What they should have done, in my opinion was they should have got somebody who was either very well known in the community who was of that age, or the previous winner the last year, and brought her in and pampered her. So that somebody in their 60s or 70s presented the prize, and instead of saying, look at her little waist, and do you remember those high heels, you would actually say, my God, look at the change in her, doesn't she look amazing? And she, this is what the beauticians did, because it then reminds people, it makes the association with people. And that, to my idea, was a, 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 would have been a good sponsorship. They actually, they misfired. They sponsored, they put the money into it, they sent somebody in to present the prizes. I doubt that anybody even connected the two. It's not about selling, but I doubt that anybody walked past and said, that's the beauticians that sponsored, because it didn't make that connection. So sponsorship, very little money. And the other thing with sponsorship, just as I think of it, when we moved back into Ring's End, we moved back after, oh, I don't know. I'd grown up and lived there till I was about 18, and I moved back about, oh, probably 25 years ago. And when I moved back, they were still delivering milk to the door. Um, but I'm what everybody calls a yappy, so I'm gone early in the morning and I'm back late in the evening. I love the way ring centers always have their own pronunciations and everything. Dubliners do it as a general rule. So I was gone early in the day, and literally it got to the stage where you come outside the door in the morning and go, oh, for God's sake, there's no milk. Or you come out and go, yippee ki yay, we have milk today. And it drove me insane. So at one stage, I met one of the neighbours and said, well, do me a favour, if you see the milkman, find out what I own, pay him off, tell him thanks very much, um, and I'll just get the milk sort of as I need it. And she said, really? What's the milkman do on you? What's the problem with the milkman? And I said, it, it, there's no problem with the milkman, it's just that, you know, the milk is there. Some days and it's not there, other days, and she said, oh, I see him, it's coming, oh yeah, yeah. We're not all like you, you know, we don't all leave in the middle of the night, come back in the middle of the night. But that poor man gets up at four o'clock in the morning to deliver the milk. I said, I know, but he should be getting up at half three, because I don't get the milk outside the door. She said, I'll tell you what I'll do. When I'm passing by, if there's milk outside your door in the morning, I'll take it and I'll put it into the shop. And I keep it cold for you. And you can collect it from the shop in the evening. And I said, just think about this. This is not logical. He jumps out of the van, leaves me the milk. You come by, oh, look, there's the milk because I've already ate. He brings it out of the shop. This is crazy. Just pay the guy off and tell me how much I owe. And he said, she said, no, no, no. You don't understand. This man goes out of his way. He's been producing milk, uh, delivering milk in this area for years and years. And he goes out of his way to sponsor the local soccer club every year. He buys them a whole set of jerseys. I thought it was a brilliant example of somebody who had connected to the community. I wasn't connected, I didn't have kids, I didn't respect what this man was doing. But she did, and the whole community did, and that's why we buy our milk from. The man has to earn a living, and he's very good, and he doesn't have to buy these t-shirts. And it really brought it home that sponsorship can have such a long-term impact on people around you. That man was getting business because people were grandparents or people like me who had no kids were told he's earning his living, he's contributing to the community. So good sponsorship, I don't know what it costs him for a set of jerseys for a football team, but it wasn't a huge amount of money. But he got the return out of it year on year on year on year. So sponsorship, the second one. Third one is exhibitions. The number of people who don't use exhibitions properly. Exhibitions, you're going to pay to attend. So you've decided as a business that this is where you should be. But the number of businesses who don't then follow through. If you book an exhibition and you book it early, if you know in January that you're doing an exhibition in September, what happens is that people send you out all of these notices. The exhibition organizers send you out notices and say, so will you be doing anything different at the exhibition? Are you launching anything extraordinary? Do you have any unusual guests? Is there anything you want to tell us about your stand that makes it different? And small to medium-sized enterprises, because they're busy, look at it and go, for God's sake, how do I know in January what I'm going to do in September? So they leave it. They just throw it to one side and say, I'll do it later. And then come August, they fill in all the information. And whoever was organizing has already decided who gets the publicity. Because in January or February, the organizer is saying, I need to know where my stories are coming from. So if you take the trouble to tell me that you're doing something different, I'll promote you. So it's, it's free PR that's sitting there waiting for them, but people don't actually take advantage of it because they need to move so much earlier. And really, if they did, they have a whole team of professional people promoting them. It's a no-brainer. should make sense. I was at an exhibition for TY students, students and teachers, 
um, last year, just before the book came out, and there was a company called High Rock Productions who had taken an exhibition stand up. And the exhibition was huge, it was in this massive warehouse in Carlo somewhere. <coughs> they went to the warehouse, and every single stand had something for transition year students. So you had, you know, learn to climb the McGillicuddy Reeks. Um, we'll teach you how to make presentation skills. Come kayaking with us. Um, a whole load of, we teach you first aid. Whole, a mix of between kind of the skills that you would use as an individual and things that you went out and did as groups. And this particular group, High Rock Productions, I stopped because when I came around the corner, there was an entire square closed off. Now what they actually do is they go into schools and they help children speak Irish. So they prep them for their oral Irish exams. But they do it by creating this play. So it's very creative. They work with the children, they create this play, and when they've made this play, they help them put it on. It's all through Irish, so they become more confident about speaking the language. Very hard thing to promote to children, most of whom probably have an interest in like oral Irish exams, and they're looking at TY, which is the year in between their exams, so they're not focusing on it. And what this group had done was they had taken a square, they had about three times the amount of space that they should have had. So they'd taken a square in front of the stand and they closed it off and they were playing virtual tennis. It was absolutely brilliant because one of the guys was there and he was saying, okay, are you ready to serve you? You step off the court, please. You're on the court. Get off the court. And as people walk past, they went, we're here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Am I, am I okay? Back, back, back. And everybody got it. There was nothing. There was absolutely nothing, but everybody got it and they stood back. And when the ball went out of play, they would say, sorry, can I, can I have the ball there? Yeah, there, no, no. At your other foot? There, yeah, can you throw it? Thank you. Yeah, got it. And everybody stopped and watched. It was brilliant. It took a huge amount of attention to their stand, and they gave everybody leaflets about what they did. I thought it was really, really clever. When I interviewed them afterwards, I said to them, by the way, you know, brilliant idea, you took over so much space like smart. And I said, yeah, but I'm not sure if it was as smart as it could have been, because it targeted all of the children. And their query was that the exhibition was targeted to both children and teachers. And with hindsight, they weren't sure if you could target both in one exhibition. And what they had done was they had successfully got all of the children involved. But the children didn't decide what they would do in TY years. The teachers did. So they'd actually, they'd, they'd misfired. They got loads of attention. They got loads of kids talking about it. But they didn't have the teachers saying, what a good idea. And people didn't connect virtual tennis with what they were actually doing. It was, it was interesting because to my eyes coming in as an outsider, I thought, very smart. Like you, you've captured the whole room. When they analyzed it afterwards, they thought, good, but not as brilliant as it could have been. Uh, I suppose one of the things that I'm um, really conscious of the PR is that it's not, it's not rocket science. Uh, it does take a lot of time, but most of the skills can be easily learned, but it's about not doing things on the fly. Because um, PR doesn't respond well to things that are done on the fly. You end up saying, why didn't that work? I put loads of time into it at short notice. It works really well if you sit down early and say, who am I trying to reach? What am I trying to achieve? How do I get them? What are they interested in? One of the very clever things, clever companies that I profiled in the book was Newbridge Silver. And Newbridge Silver, um, I'm a great believer in third party endorsement. If you stand up and say, no, I run a wonderful business. That's a marvelous business. Everybody in it loves what they do. We provide great quality product or whatever. Everybody would say, yeah. But you would say that, wouldn't you? Which is fair enough, because you're not going to say, I run a rubbish business. Well, who was the guy who did that? His jewelry business went bust. <clears throat> there was a man who famously said he just produces junk jewelry, and people buy it, and the entire business went bust uh, very shortly afterwards. Because everybody said, well, I, I buy that junk jewelry, and he thinks it's junk. Why do I waste my time buying it? But as a general rule, you're looking at third party endorsement is where somebody says of you, it's good or where you create an association. And Newbridge are very clever at creating the association. They came up with this idea of style ambassadors. So instead of it just being Jude, they started using people like Amy Guberman and Naomi Campbell and Roland O'Gara and say, okay, these are people who, who you can associate with our jewelry. Interestingly enough, they used Linda Gray. You know the lady from Dallas? That's interesting. How many people actually know Linda Gray from Dallas? Very few. Excellent, thank you. It makes my point because she was wearing, she was interviewed on the late eight years ago when they started using her, and she was wearing big, chunky Newbridge jewelry. Now, she's a fabulous woman. She was in her 70s at the time. You would have given her like 52 at the most. She looked amazing. And she was wearing this chunky jewelry, and you looked and thought, 
she, she actually isn't the type of person who wears chunky jewelry. If she had been doing Newbridge cutlery, dining at home, uh, here's, here's how the posh dine, it probably would have sat much more easily, but doing chunky jewelry at her age, even though she was glamorous, didn't seem to work. But it did work very well with the likes of Amy Huberman and Naomi Campbell. And what they do is they associate the people with the product. So if they're stylish and they're, they wear our product, you should do the same. Very interestingly, when I spoke to the lady who coordinates their brand ambassadors, I said to her that it must be very difficult because I innocently assumed that if you were Amy Huberman and you were wearing Newbridge, that as Newbridge you would say, and by the way, Sweet Pea, I do not want you wearing anybody else's jewellery because we're paying you shed loads of money, so I expect to see you in Newbridge only. And she said, oh God, no, no, no. And because nobody who follows Amy Huberman would believe that. They would know that of course she wears, she has her own style, and she wears any one of a number of different things. So when she chooses to wear Newbridge, we're happy that she does so. But when she chooses to wear somebody else, we're equally happy, and I thought it was very clever because it then doesn't look like we pay you to wear this jewelry all the time. It looks like, yes, you're a brand ambassador, but when you feel like wearing it. And she actually wore a long chain. And um, when she announced that she was expecting her second child, she wore a long Newbridge chain. And she tweeted, because she's a mad tweeter. And she tweeted something about the coat, I can't remember, bump by bod, chain by Newbridge. And they sold out. They had no idea she was going to do it. They, they knew. When she was doing the photo, she was pregnant that she was pregnant, but she didn't want to say anything about it. And when she eventually tweeted it, it was just like, it's her call, it's her baby. So she tweeted it. They weren't expecting it. They sold out of the chain. They went to a second production, and they sold out of the second production as well. The number of people who just wanted to buy that chain. So the association, from their point of view, worked really well. They associated with people that people want to look like or people want to emulate. And they followed that through with Museum of Style icons. So they actually have all of these clothes, which are actually, if you've been down to see them, the clothes are like moth-eaten, and it's incredible um, how old the clothes are, but they were Audrey Hepburn's, or they were, um, who was the lady who went up as Princess Grace of Monaco? Um, Grace Kelly. So you, you end up looking at these clothes thinking, wow, that's what people actually wore. Did anybody go down for the Michael Jackson exhibition, by the way? They had Michael Jackson's um, clothes, and you know that famous glove, the sparkly glove? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just decided I had to go down. You never saw anything like the trousers. I actually said to somebody, are they real? Trousers were about this wide. My God, he was tiny. He was like size eight would have been giant. He was absolutely tiny. Um, but they, they actually made that association, and it's clever. It's an association with style, with glamour. You call in, you buy some of the product, you've made the link. Very, very smart. And they also work with um, Audrey Hepburn's and Grace Kelly's foundation so that they approve whatever it is they design that they use. This would have been the kind of thing that Grace Kelly would have used. Um, so it, it carries her name with it. Very, very smart. Much simpler third party endorsement, if you like. When I was talking about the book to Bobby Kerr on News Talk, uh, he had said to me, OK, what I'll do is I'll choose the examples that we use. And I said, sure, I don't mind. Ask me about anything that's in the book, I'm happy to talk about it. So he actually talked about Jackie Marsh, and then he talked about Jack Murray's company. And we literally, I mean, it's a what, 10 or 12 minute interview. So we went through the interview and we chatted, and I said, oh, this guy's crazy. I mean, you go into his office, the walls are papered with paper. And every piece of paper has this tweet, how many retweets, what was the reach, is it worth doing, did it work, should we do it again? He data mines within an inch of his life. And it just seems so strange that it's all on paper around the walls. But I presume it's because it surrounds him and it reminds him, this is what we are, this is what we do. Did the interview, happy out, promotion for the book, my job was done. As I was, that was on a Saturday, on Sunday as I was driving somewhere, I got a text from Jack to say, thanks very much for the kind words about my business yesterday. I knew his father was ill, he said, unfortunately my father has died. And somebody heard the interview on their way to the funeral. And very kind of you to say such nice things, my thought, that's very decent to actually text and let me know, so I said, sorry to hear about your dad. Um, and thanks for the comments. And then on following Friday, I came into the office and there's this huge box of cupcakes. So I said, oh, lads, who's sending us cupcakes? And said, us, us. It specifically says Ellen Gunning. Said, oh, it's all about me. Who's sending me cupcakes? And inside was a note. There was a dozen cupcakes and a note from the same Jack saying, Ellen, thank you very much for uh, all of the comments on News Talk. You wouldn't believe how much business we got on the background. Best regards, Jack. I wasn't promoting his business, I wasn't flogging his business, I wasn't advertising it, I was just saying he's really good at what he does. And that's a third party endorsement. That's somebody else saying it with no axe to grind. 
And that is very, very powerful. And that's something, actually, that you and Google can do very easily. You work with SMEs. You've already gone through who they are. You've cross-checked them. You, you think they have something of value that you can invest your time or your money or your energy into. Um, is there a way that you can actually say to people, do you know what, there is a way that you can brand, you can say brand Google um, works with you, so that they can take that to other people and say, it's not just me saying I know what I'm at, Google believes I know what I'm at. So just to leave you with that thought, there are six other hot tips in the book, I'm happy to go through all of them if you wish, but I might actually give you a chance to, because you're, you're sitting quietly nodding, and I'm much more comfortable when people are interrupting the hell out of me, so I might let you ask a few questions and see what happens. Thanks, for it. Thank, thanks, um, Alan, that was, was fantastic, yeah. So, will we jump straight in, does anyone have a, a burning question that they'd, that they'd like to ask? We've got two microphones to pass around. Burning questions are really good. Not not no. normal. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so while you're you're building up some uh, some confidence and trying to think about it, um, I'd like to to know, Alan. Um, you touched on very very briefly about knowing your audience and considering who exactly am I trying to reach. So other than maybe just asking yourself those really specific questions. Is there anything else though? What what else can we be asking ourselves, or how else can we really answer that question? I tell you the trap that most people fall into. Um, we all look to reach people in the, using the same methods that we use. So if I read the Irish Times, I assume that everybody I want to reach can read the Irish Times. If I live on social media, I assume they'll all live on social media. And what happens is we, we forget to look at the other side and say, actually, where do they, I, I call it where people feed. I attended a, a conference a few years back, and the guy talked about chasing pigeons. I don't know if you've heard this story before. I thought it was brilliant. And he talked about if you chase pigeons, if you try to feed pigeons, and you chase them in a park, the pigeons fly away. It's like, go away, stop chasing me, you're bugging me. Watch the old man who sits down in the park seat and he just keeps dropping crumbs. And the pigeons come to him. And it's about knowing what are the pigeons looking for? Bread, they're not looking for hassle, they'll come to you. And the more often they come to you, the more they trust you, and the more you, they, you build up their confidence. With any kind of an audience, you, your problem is that you look at them from the inside out, you should look from the outside in. The chances are with any business, you actually need to use, a, they said originally when, when radio was overtaken by television, or when television was invented, they said it's the death of radio. When newspapers came in, they said it was the death of something else. When social media came in, they said, oh, well, that's it, people will only use social media. It's actually not true. We did, we did an interview at the weekend, we were teaching a TV presenters course, and we were doing mock interviews in advance of the real thing for the showreels. And one of the ladies, the, the, um, students were just interviewing each other. They're all adults, they're all over 20 odd. And the Jimmy Greeley, who was leading it, said to one of the girls, what are you interested in? And she said, acting. And he said to the other girl, brilliant. So ask her about Meryl Streep's speech, Donald Trump retweeting, the Golden Globes, all that kind of stuff. It was, a, it was fascinating to watch. She said to her, so Meryl Streep's speech, you are all familiar that Meryl Streep mm -hmm. made a speech. Okay, just check. Uh, Meryl, Streep's, Meryl Streep's speech at the Golden Globes. What did you think of it? And she said, uh, I don't know, I didn't hear it. What was it about? And she said, okay. And she gave her a very quick explanation. And she said, uh, and Donald Trump retweeted, you know, the most overrated actress in America or whatever. She said, yeah, I can see that. And she said, okay, well, what do you think about the fact that the president-elect is tweeting about an actress? And she said, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any. I have no idea. I catch up on all my social media on Sunday mornings. <laughs> and it was eye-opening. It was like everybody in the room assumed everybody had heard Meryl Streep. How could you miss it? Because it had been tackled from so many different angles. And in her world, Sunday morning was when she caught up on everything. So it's looking at your audience from that point of view and saying, if, they read, if they're Sunday newspaper readers, then that's where you need to get them. It, it doesn't matter that you could be all over social media. They won't find you. If they're social media people, then where? What bloggers do they actually read? Um, who influences them? Who do they think is rubbish? Who do they think is brilliant? If it's radio, which radio stations do they listen to? So are they news talk listeners or RT1 listeners? It's a different listener. You tune to the dial and you stay more or less on the dial if you're of a certain age group. And then if you're of a certain age group as well, do you actually go hunting for information or does it come into you by email? So it's really, it's breaking down your audience and probably choosing a different tool for each subsection. That's a very long answer. That's a very great. Long question. Well, that's Sorry. a great answer. Thank you very much. We've got a question here, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I was thinking, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was thinking in terms of sponsorships. Um, so I think most of us here are you know, expats, so not from Ireland. Uh, so we're not that deep into the community, as you kind of mentioned some of the examples that you had. What would be some of the easy ways to kind of get into, you know, getting a, a sponsorship or getting in touch with people? What would be some of the uh, first couple of steps to getting uh, sponsorships? To actually find something that's sponsoring, I would go the other way around. If you're not from Ireland, I would choose something that was unique to you. So it might be Brazilian movies or something. And you think, okay, have a look at the community and see where is there a community week. And if there's a community week, is there a role in there somewhere for movies? And as part of the movies, we can show Brazilian movies. It depends on what the connection is that you're trying to make. But it also sets you up. You are the logical connection. So you can actually introduce yourself and say, I'm Brazilian. That's why I'm passionate about Brazilian movies. You never would have guessed. And people would actually, oh, that Because people actually won't make the connection unless you tell them. That's the other thing. They will say you're an expat or whatever. You're not Irish, but they won't know where you're from. And so I would look for something that is close to your heart, that you're an expert in, that you can offer to sponsor, but it's more work. It means that you need to set it up, create it, and run it. But if you do, people will come. When I did the first um, Active Age Week, everybody told me that I was wasting my time if I was looking at creating things for senior citizens, what they were interested in was bingo. So if I did bingo, <laughs> oh, God, so if I did bingo seven nights a week, they'd be happy out. And I said, look at this face. Does this look like a face that ever played bingo? Or, or has any desire to create bingo nights? Not happening. But what I will do is I'll do one night of bingo. But I will do everything else around it. And if nobody comes to anything, there's my butt. You can kick it and say, I told you, you dirty look at Egypt, you were wrong. And we did historical nights, we did boat trips, we did um, mystery trips out into the country, we did afternoons where people just came in and somebody played piano and they all sang. We were blocked out every single the standing room only at every single function. And they all turned up for bingo as well. But <laughs> nobody said at the end of the week, what a pity it wasn't all bingo. So I think if you actually, if you find something, that you're passionate about, that you can create, people will come and it will make the association. It also gives you a niche that nobody else has. The other thing with sponsorship is if you come in to sponsor after somebody has been there, it takes a long time to lose the last sponsor's name. So the general rule is that you should sponsor, if you're doing a sponsorship deal, it should be for three years, and you should add an extra two. So you have a facility that nobody else can step in for the next two, you get first dibs on it. But after five, you should move on. And it's back to your audience again. Because after five, if you're targeting 17-year-olds, the 17-year-olds are now 18, 19, 21, 22. If they're no longer interested in the same things, they've moved on to something else. But after five years, your name stays for at least two. So the next sponsor coming in has an awful job branding their name onto whatever it is they're doing. So I'd go the other route and create it with your name on it and let them follow you. Hi, uh, my name is Esgi. I'm working in sales team, in Google Marketing Solutions team. Uh, in fact, mine is not a question, it's just an inspiration for you. It was very, very eye-opening. At Google, we try, at Google sales team, we try to increase our share of wallets from our clients' media business. Mm -hmm. But today, you gave me another amazing idea why we are only trying to increase our budget within our clients' media investment. Also, we can have fair share from our clients' PR budget as well, if we can position Google products as a PR solutions. It was very, very eye-opening, and it was a huge leverage for my business when I turned back to my desk 100%. I will, I will do meetings, I will uh, organize meetings with my clients' PR managers, and I will talk about YouTube to them. They can use for their PRs. And I just want Thank half you. a percent of that business. That's, that's <laughs> but actually you're right because advertising very often is part of a promotional plan. So you, you can do a huge amount of PR that actually gets you out there and gets your product or your brand known. But it gets to the stage where you say, now I need to sell it. But you will still use PR to enhance. Part of it is the straight selling and the other is you still keep turning up and people say, oh I saw an ad for that somewhere. So brilliant. Let me know how you got on with it. Mm -hmm. I can sure. brag about I you. We can have a mutual <laughs> love in. Hi, I have a, have a question. Uh, coming back to your milkman st uh, story, that was very inspiring. Like, um, my, my thought was uh, probably the milkman didn't realize the effect that uh, the sponsorship has. I'm sure so, he didn't. So my question is, if an uh, SME uh, decides to do a PR investment, uh, what kind of advice can you give defining what success is? It depends on what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, so what sponsorship is best at is creating name awareness. 
If you look at any of the great sponsorships, they started because people were moving into new markets or they had changed their name. So the company was no longer known as one thing, it was now known as something else. Um, when, who sponsored the, the first cycle race around Ireland? Was it Toyota? Um, and they sponsored it because it's a car company. It doesn't make sense that a car company would sponsor a cycle race. It was at the time when um, Stephen Roach and all of those guys were winning medals. But it was because the Toyota used to be called, was it Toyota used to be called Datsun? And people didn't know the brand. So the whole idea was, if you create an awareness of the brand, people say, I've heard of you, uh, what's the story? Uh, it opens the door a bit. So what sponsorship is best at is creating brand awareness. So if you're an SME and you're trying to make con people conscious of the fact that you're around, sponsorship is very good at it. But you need to do your before and after. Most people will tell you. If you ask people in Google, how many people have heard of Google? Well, Google's probably a bad example. You go, oh my God, the whole world. <laughs> You know, is there anybody left in the world? There are a couple of people in Mars, I believe, who haven't heard of us yet, but you know, everybody has heard of us. Every SME does the same thing. They say, well, they were very well known. And it is true within their own circle. So if it's within a public relations circle or within an IT circle, they probably are very well known, but they're not very well known to a wider world. So if you're sponsoring within the community because you just want the community to know who you are, what you do, you're on their doorstep, and they should really be thinking of you in terms of maybe future employment or uh, just saying to people they're good guys and they're up there and they're doing great work, then it will work very well for that. But you need, you need research in advance and research afterwards. It doesn't have to be hugely scientific. You can, so long as you structure the questions, you probably know this, but so long as you structure the questions so that they're open enough and people don't know what the answer is. Because if you ask people, do you think Google is wonderful? They'll say, yes, I do. If they think Google is awful, they'll say, probably. If you say, what do you think of Google? You'll get an honest answer because you haven't told them what it is you expect. You can do it by, if it's a community thing, you can send people out into the community saying, have you ever heard of this organization? Any idea of what they do? Who's in the building down in the corner there? Um, and you, you find out a lot, but what you do is you go back and you do the same research afterwards. Um, and don't expect that everybody will suddenly say, oh my God, we've all heard of it. But if you get like a 5% increase, that's good, you're moving in the right direction. And again, it's targeted to your audience and the people you stop to ask questions of. We sent a group out, I'm sorry, it's a very long-winded answer, but we sent a group out at one stage um, we were training journalists and I sent them out to do interviews with people and I said now be sure you don't get all the same people so don't ask stop people who look like you stop people across a mix of age groups stop men and women do everything from like 17 to 77 or something um, and try and make subtly make some kind of note about middle-aged senior person younger person so that when you come back you can say I interviewed because it was for radio so I interviewed 10 people four of them would have been under 25 and the others were over 55 and the guys actually went out, they were Italian. Any Italians in the room? They have a whole other way of doing things. So he went out and he said, hello, I'm a John Rocco. So please you tell me how old are you? And they said, I'm 36 and a half, I'm 42. I couldn't believe it. If an Irish person did it, they'd be picking you up off the ground. <laughs> but it's, it's the audience you're trying to reach. So if you target the age group as well carefully, but that also means watching who you send them to do it. Send out a young person to target older people, they won't do it as well. Send out an older person that's the same age group stopping you you get more honest answers. Um, I was wondering, before you wrote your book, did you know what audience you were targeting, or did that come along when you were writing? How did you decide your audience that you target? Um, what happened was, this is my second book about public relations. The first book that I wrote is called Public Relations Practical Approach, and it's studied by everybody in Ireland who studies the art. So, we are respected for colleges. It's an academic text. It's a, it's a, it's a doorstop. It's about 600 pages or something. I actually thought that I would be revising that book, but not doing anything else with PR. And I had met with Mercier Press, who published the book, and I actually met with them about a client's book. Um, and they had said, I'd sent them the, the pitch, and they came back and said, actually, we wouldn't be interested. You know, we meet you, and we wouldn't be interested in um, publishing the book for the client. And I said, well, that's fine. I really appreciate you having a look at it. Where else should we go with the book? Who else should publish it? And at the end of the conversation, she said, but you never thought of writing another book on public relations yourself, did you? And I said, well, to answer your question, I no, because I've kind of covered everybody who studies the subject. And she said, well, what about SMEs? Oh, yeah. I looked, I have no sense. They say yes to all the things that interest me. And then give out yards and say, why did I decide to do Who scheduled this? Me. But I actually thought, great idea. Um, and it was completely different because I said to her, what I do is, um, I, I know the things that SMEs use, but it gave me an opportunity to go out and look for companies in that sector, because we all look at the larger companies. So it was look at smaller companies and see how they're using it well um, and how we could use them as case studies. So the, the audience almost found itself because that was the way the request came to the book. 
Thank you. Here. Um, well, I was uh, thinking about the, um, the sponsorship and the fact that it's very good for the brand awareness, that it's needed in a very initial phase of the business. What happens when uh, you do something bad with this PR tool? So you um, basically uh, compromise your reputation in a very initial phase. So uh, do you have an example of good good example of how some business could have recovered from a bad usage of sponsorship? Um, it's very interesting that you hit on reputation. Reputation takes a lifetime to build and about 30 seconds to lose. What was Warren Buffett said? If you think that everything you do will be publicly known, you'll be very careful about what you do. And that's about reputation, because you, you lose reputation very easily. People do very stupid things with reputation. Probably one of the, the best examples um, was the, I can't think of the name of the company, was it Trammell? The company who had, do you remember when there was, now uh, going back 25 years or more, the company where the guy was actually injecting Tylenol into tablets in the States? Um, it was just Tylenol tablets. I just remember the brand name. He was injecting cyanide into Tylenol tablets. Anyway, it, it made people very nervous about actually using the product, and they had a great reputation, they were very well known. And what they did was, and most people in PR thought they were crazy at the time, what they did was, they withdrew all of the product from the shelves. And they put messages out everywhere saying, do not use our product. If you have it at home, bring it back, we'll give you a full refund. For God's sake, don't take any tablets. We don't know what's going on. We don't want anybody to die because they've taken, I think, two people in New York to die. And we don't know what's happened. Everybody said, you know, great move from a PR point of view. Obviously, they care about the customers. They're going to have nothing left to come back to because they've left this gap and their competitors will take it over. And when they came back, they came back with that foil seal. And they said, so now we've made it extra safe. So now you will know if anybody has tampered with these tablets, you check. The seal shouldn't be broken, the foil should be intact. It was very clever and they recovered market share very quickly because people actually said they care about it. They, they, an example of one who got it very wrong was Shell in the States um, when they did all that damage and they sent over, and the, where they got it wrong was from minute one, they sent over an English chief executive, uh, an English PR person, uh, or a UK PR person, and a UK lawyer. So you had, you're in the States, where everybody talks like this, okay? So like, what are they doing? Okay, they were to mess the whole thing up. And you get, hello, I'm the chief executive. And I'm over here in America, and I'm gonna sort it out. Hello, I'm the PO person, I'm over here with them. Just common sense says, and respect the country that you're in. Now that's down to reputation. If you actually respect your customers in that country, you get somebody with local eyes and ears on the ground. You get somebody who's American who says, this is how it works. Um, this is just <coughs> language. This is how people will interpret what you're saying. Um, and their reputation suffered massively. I'm not sure that it was covered yet. And you find an awful lot of companies when they, when their reputation is severely damaged, they actually completely rename the company. Because it, it, the research says you won't recover. People will always associate you with the disaster. <coughs> so they, they have no option. But it's a good example of if you don't get it right, <laughs> how much damage you can do, that's the other side. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alan. That, that was amazing. Some fast, fantastic stories. And I know there are a few more questions that we don't have time to get around to, but you have different ways that we can contact you that you, you've already Absolutely. shared with me. So I can share them out with everyone else. So thank you again for being our first That's speaker of the year. And you did say everybody chases out a problem. Thank <laughs> you.